Today we dive into this famous and for many of us familiar story of Jesus. Uh, and if it's not familiar to you, don't worry, you'll get exposed to it now in this time. But the challenge for those of us for whom it's familiar is how do we hear a familiar story in a fresh way for our lives today? And so I want to offer you three tips for getting more into the story and understanding what it means. So number one, Remember who is with Jesus. Remember the tax collector or the Pharisees and scribes were muttering because Jesus was welcoming tax collectors and sinners and eating with them. And so we have kind of the, this group of religious people and we've got this group of, we could say, worldly people on the other hand. Number two, listen for Israel's stories. Now Martha's done a great job of weaving tons of biblical stories into this and they're going to come at you really quickly in this drama. When Jesus originally told this story, his hearers would have heard at least the 23rd Psalm, and the story of Isaac and Jacob and Esau, if not many more. And then, thirdly, look for the offstage characters. I know that's kind of strange. Look for the people you can't see, right? That's basically what I'm telling you. But look for the offstage characters. The village is mentioned later. The people gathered for the party, they play a role for more than just the end. So look for them. And watch how Jesus takes this story that is particular for Israel and he turns it into something that is universal, including all of us, and centering on himself. Enjoy. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So in these three weeks of this joy series, we've been focusing on Luke chapter 15. And if you want to, you can even pull out your Bibles as a reference uh, as we go through uh, the message time and kind of think about the sum total of what we've experienced and what God's calling us to do. Um, so what we've been through so far in this joy series is we've encountered a shepherd who lost his sheep and then found it, and then he called a whole bunch of people together to celebrate because everyone rejoices when the lost are found. And then we met a woman who lost her coin and then found it, and then gathered a whole bunch of people together to celebrate because everyone rejoices when the lost are found. And now in this third part of Jesus' story, we get a father who loses his son and then finds him and then gathers a whole bunch of people together to celebrate because everyone rejoices when the lost are found, right? Not exactly. Not exactly a happy homecoming for all involved in this story. And the unresolved tension in that third part of Jesus' story points us to where Jesus wants us to pay the most attention. The unresolved tension in the story invites us to resolve it and to wrestle with it in our own lives. You see, Jesus, in telling this story, is telling the story of Israel in a new way that is universal, including all people, and it's centering on himself. And so he invites you to see yourself in it. Now, I'm going to give you some limitations on how you are invited to see yourself in the story. For instance, sometimes when I've asked this in an open-ended way, who do you see yourself in the story, somebody's answered something like, I think I'm like the fattened calf. Uh, that's clever? <laughs> Maybe less helpful. Um, I've also had other people who have jumped right to the resonance with that father figure. And I can understand that, especially if you're a parent. But in light of what the story ultimately means and who the characters are, I think it's a bit presumptuous for us to start with the father. So think about these younger son and this older son as kind of two types of people in our world. And maybe they're not clean categories. Maybe you've got a little bit of both. But these are two kind of ways of being that are prevalent in our world. So here we see the whole cast of characters. And now we'll dive into that younger son. The younger son, he's obviously lost. He's far from home. He is physically absent. He's like the sheep in Jesus' first part of the story, lost out in the wilderness. Now, as I look at the actions and the attitudes of this younger son, it seems to me that this is the type of person who's seeking the good life, who wants to be free and to experience pleasures and beauty in this world. 
and is a bit indulgent. Kind of the guiding philosophy seems to be like, why not? Why not ask for a whole bunch of money that isn't really mine yet and kind of basically wish my father dead in the process? What's the worst that could happen? I'll enjoy myself in the process. And dad will bankroll it. Um, so, uh, and then it's this son, see, he's running away from God by breaking all the rules, by doing all the wrong things. And where he can go wrong in his relationship with God, where this type of person can go wrong in their relationship with God, is to demand of God and to sort of uh, yell at him, you don't own me. Your rules don't mean a whole lot to me. I live life by my own rules. I play life by my own rules. And then to others who try to interact with this younger uh, child uh, in a way like an older brother would do, it, the younger child is kind of like, I don't really care what you think. <laughs> Your rules are great for you, but I've got my own playbook here. And so this younger son is lost through prideful, selfish rebellion. And a key learning when it comes to joy for this younger son orientation is that cutting ties with our creator robs us of joy. Ultimately, he borrows a whole bunch of money or he gets his money in advance and then he blows it all. And he has to come crawling back because life without God is not a sustainable way to live. Now, the question becomes, how is this younger son expected to get God? How are things supposed to change for this younger son orientation? The common formula in Jesus' day was like this. You pay your dues, uh, you grovel, and you work really hard and become responsible like your older brother in coming home. And then eventually you'll be accepted again. And this was kind of the going rate for what it meant to get God in Jesus' day. I think in some ways we construct our formula similarly and wrongly today. And we'll see that when we look at the older brother. See, the older son is another kind of person. This older son is lost not out in the wilderness, not an obvious lostness, but more of a covert lostness, which makes it harder to own up to, which makes it harder to see, makes it easier for you to be blind to these kind of dispositions. This older son is lost like the coin in the second story at home. And as I look at this son and the actions and attitudes of this person, this is, this is someone who's trying to be a good person in life, trying to do the right things and be responsible, seeking to define their life by accomplishments. And the guiding philosophy is like, what needs to get done around here? I'm going to be involved in doing that, of course. The thing about this son, uh, though, is that he's running from God by doing all the right things. Because when it comes back to a relationship with God, that person then feels entitled to come back to God like, you owe me. How come they're getting such a good life? I'm doing all the right things. What gives? And when this older son type of person interacts with the younger son, the younger brother, it's kind of this attitude of like, I am so much better than you. I maybe wouldn't tell you to your face. Maybe I would. But I think it pretty clearly. This older son is lost through prideful self-righteousness and expects that younger son to become more like him because he's in the right. This older son has a learning about joy too. That comparisons with others rob us of joy. You see, this older son, he's all hot and bothered about the fact that his share of the inheritance now is you know, partially going to the support of his brother coming back. Well, if this story is about God and his great love and the riches of heaven, then does that matter in the grand scheme of things? Is there enough of God's love to go around? Is it an inexhaustible resource? Enough to cover the sins of all the people in all the world? Yeah. Yeah. So the older son, he needs to get found as well. You see, the way to get God is not to get religion and become more like the older brother. The way to get God is to get the gospel, to know the depths of the Father's love for you, to receive that love, 
And that love will be transformative for our hearts and lives. It'll make you become gradually ever more like the Father. You see, for this older brother, he needs to remember that joy comes when we know we've received an undeserved gift, when we've received undeserved love. And that joy comes through sharing that gift with other people who don't deserve it. But he's not doing either one of those things. You see, the older son has to travel home as well. He needs to get found as well, and he may be less prone to see that he needs it than that younger son is because it's not as obvious. So let's look at that father figure, that third person in the equation. That father is absolutely remarkable. He is better than any Middle Eastern patriarch father would ever have been, let alone any all-star American dad that is in our midst. And I know we got some great dads in this congregation right now. But he runs out to both of his sons and he offers costly love to both of them, remarkably. And somehow this father in this story manages to carry himself in such a way as to say, I will love you no matter what, And yet, I love you too much to let you stay where you are. Something's got to happen here. You have room to grow. And will you just share my joy? You see, this father, he doesn't let the sons kind of play out their own way of life. He interrupts each one of them. And he runs out to meet them. Remarkably, the father doesn't stay in the home and say, they'll come home when they're ready, the father leaves the house. First, he does it for the younger son. He sees him coming from the distance, and he runs out to greet them, which, by the way, that's something that no Middle Eastern patriarch ever does, even in cases of emergency. That is beneath the stature of them. They float with poise. So to hike up your robe and run down the road after your son is way out of league. That is way undignified. He is reckless and he looks ridiculous to the village. But why is he running? Because he wants to get out there before they do. Because that village was the one with whom that younger son needed to change currency. He got the gift of land and he had to liquidate his assets so he could leave. So the village is well aware of the shame surrounding this family and this younger son's actions. And they are ready to carry out the punishment due to this kid and turn him away, disown him. If he comes back, they're going to shove him back out. So the father in this equation is usually expected to be right there at the edge of the gate with them and acting the ceremony or else just leaving leaving him to his own devices. But he doesn't do that. He runs out to his son and he covers him with protective, costly love and he looks ridiculous and humiliated in the process, but he saves his son's life. But he doesn't just run out to the one son. You see, the father goes out to the other son as well. There's a feast going on. And that older brother, he was supposed to be at the front door welcoming all the guests. He was supposed to be there serving all the meals as a representative of the family. And he wasn't there. He was out in the back throwing a tantrum about how life's unfair. And the father would have been expected to either condemn his son verbally in the presence of his guests and say, I'll deal with that so-and-so later or else go out and make an example of him in front of his guests in order to transfer that humiliation to his son so he gets what's coming to him. But he didn't do that. He went out of the house and he pleaded with his son. Don't you know how good you have it? Won't you share my joy? Won't you just share my heart in this matter? Can't you join the celebration? It's absolutely remarkable. It's something that no normal father does. You see, in this seemingly simple story, we all of a sudden start to see pictures of what Jesus did. You see, Jesus didn't stay in the house of heaven. He left his comfort zone. He left the riches of heaven and he came down into planet earth and he met us on the road and there he took up a cross and walked it down the road and up a hill and died absorbing the punishment that we had. 
the comeuppance that we had coming to us, rebellious, self-righteous as we are. And Jesus there was crucified between a repentant sinner and a mocker. They're extending God's divine love to both of them if they could only see it. So, brothers and sisters, we're invited into this story. The big idea is everyone rejoices when the lost are found, and I'm gonna give you three tips as we close up this message time for getting more out of the story. Number one, connect the story to the cross. Can we say, check, we've done that in this time, all right? We've seen it. Number two, ask yourself, who am I in this story? Am I more like the younger son or am I more like the older son? And usually honest contemplation about those things leads us to a place that says, God, I need from you love that I have not deserved. Show that to me again. Give that to me again. And remind me of how amazing it is so that I can share your joy. And then thirdly, ask God, what are you saying to me? And what do you want me to do about it? How do you want my way of thinking and feeling and relating with the other people with whom I inhabit planet Earth? How do you want that to look differently so that when they see me and they hear me, they hear more of you and less of me? So let's close this message time in prayer. Father, we can hardly believe your amazing, reckless, ridiculous, undignified love that extends to us even today. We thank you so much for giving us what we in no way deserve. We can hardly begin to fathom it. Let your redeeming love that we know so well through Jesus and his cross transform our lives so that we know that we've received undeserved love and so that we long to share it with the people around us. Lead us, Father, not to become more like older brothers, but to become more like you. Lead us to join in the rescue mission that you have for planet Earth. Lead us to run after and to rejoice when the lost are found. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.